see Mr. Bill. Come on, let's go. Look at that outfit. Oh my God, it's it's Valentine's Day. How cool is that? Are you are you feeling excited about uh, Valentine's Day? Beautiful outfit. Love your sweater. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor College of Medicine. So lots of lots of stuff to talk about. A lot of great science this week and some very positive news. Uh, I know when you turn on the TV and all your friends talk about all the variants of concern, it's, it's all scary. But in the greater scheme of life, it, things are uh, things are really looking good. So, if you look at the national data, we are in a pretty steep decline. I mean, this is what we've been waiting for: a pretty steep decline in overall number of cases. Of course, we still are, you know, above 450,000 deaths, and I am sure we will get to 500,000 before it's all over. But we are at least uh, on the right track. If you look at the top 10 sort of hot spots, uh, they're, they're in funny places, mostly in the South, South Carolina, Arkansas, Kentucky. Uh, New York has creeped up in there, but North Carolina and Texas are also kind of hot spots. And one bit of concern for Texas is that four of the 10 uh, counties that have the most new cases in the last seven days are in Texas, mostly in West Texas and the Rio Grande Valley. So obviously we need to spend more time looking at what's going on there, whether it's just transmission of the usual virus or it's a variant sneaking in, uh, we don't know. The, in the Texas Medical Center data looks almost too good. We're, we're excited finally. Our effective reproduction number is below one. It's been below one for several days, but it hit a new low down to 0.7. Uh, that's been that's the lowest it's been in months. Uh, our positivity rate is again uh, dropped down below 10 percent for for the first time in a long time. We want it well below five percent, but it's in the right direction. Case numbers are coming down as well slowly, not as fast as we'd like, but we're down to 1,500 cases. That is ridiculously high. We need it to be under 200 cases, but it's coming down significantly. Last week was almost. 3,000 cases. And if you look at the graph for the rolling uh, weekly average, daily average, you can see that we're finally making some progress with those numbers really coming down. And not surprisingly, it's a little bit lagging, but hospitalizations are also coming down. So if you look at um, how we're doing with vaccines, we're doing okay. The whole country is only doing okay, but we're making progress. We've got just about a half a million people who've been at least received one dose in the in the Houston community. You know, remember we got to get that closer to five million, uh, and there are 42 million people in the United States who've been vaccinated. And of course, we got to get to 250 million. So, long, long way to go. But with the hopefully with the introduction of the AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson vaccines, we'll be in much better position to start expanding. Uh, uh, the, 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 the delivery of vaccines. One of the concerns locally, of course, is that uh, we want to make sure that the communities that are most hit by this uh, virus are also the ones that get vaccinated. We've had some problems getting the distribution right. Uh, Harris County uh, has all the ability uh, through their health system to deliver more vaccines and for reasons that are not clear to me have not gotten as many vaccines as some of the other health systems. So hopefully that will be corrected soon and our Harris Health Department will be able to start vaccinating uh, the folks who really are the ones most affected by this particular pandemic. So the big news, of course, is the variants and uh, uh, there's some updated information on the variants. We're almost 700 uh, cases of uh, the, the UK variant uh, in the US that's been reported in 33 different states. I'm sure it's much more than that, but that's what we, the CDC has reported. We have uh, six cases in three states uh, for the South African variant. And the Brazilian variant was originally identified in Minnesota. Uh, there was a recent Chronicle paper that suggested that we may see that in Fort Bend, but that is yet to be confirmed by the CDC. So a couple of really, really interesting papers that came out. Uh, this past week in science. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about it because it's, you know, just reporting the variants isn't uh, enough. I think it's important to understand what's going on. So, 
Remember I talked about the, the, re, the reproduction of this virus is through a polymerase. It's an enzyme that's like a typist. It types very clearly each uh, sequence, and it makes mistakes. The, the interesting thing is there is another enzyme that actually proofreads those mistakes. And so when the substitutions happen in error, there's a proofreading mechanism that limits the number of errors. And so the substitutions that we see, you know, individual amino acid substitutions, they, they are happening at, happening at a relatively slow rate compared to other uh, RNA viruses. The concern, though, is that there's also mutations that happen where a big chunk is missing. So imagine you're typing a 10-page uh, short story and one of the pages is missing. That's a problem because the proofreading enzyme doesn't pick that up. Well, well, how would that happen? See, normally if you're infected and you develop an immune response, you know, you, you sort of take care of all the viruses. There might be one mutant that escapes. But these deletion mutations take a little bit longer to develop. And so these evolve in people who are having trouble handling the virus. Cancer patients, immune suppressed patients, or just patients who have long-term infection. Those deletion mutations seem to be appearing in those types of individuals. And they're a concern because when you take a chunk of the, remember I told you the, about 1,000 amino acids is, is, is required to form the spike protein. If you take a chunk out of that, it kind of bends it or changes the conformation uh, so that the antibodies that we generate may not recognize those. Uh, the receptor binding domain at the tip of the spike still remains, the ability to, to bind to the ACE receptor is still there, but these conformational changes that happen with deletion mutations are what we're really concerned about. That's the issue with the Brazilian strain, and that's the issue with the South African strain. There's also a deletion in the UK strain, but not one that has affected uh, the immune response. So we don't know yet whether or not they will escape uh, the, the ability of our body to recognize it. We do know it, these deletion mutations do reduce the ability of our body to neutralize the, the virus and a little bit um, reduce the, the ability of the vaccine to, to, to generate antibodies to, to, to neutralize it. So that's what we're really looking at right now is a combination of these individual substitutions as well as uh, big deletion mutations. So that's what goes on with the mutations in the spike protein. There's a lot of real interest in recombination. So that, you know, recombination is not uh, just having a deletion or a substitution, that's when a chunk of a virus goes on to another related virus and recombines into something that's a real problem. And there was a paper uh, out of uh, Duke and Los Alamos, uh, Bet Corber's group uh, and Dr. Lee from Duke, who looked at uh, recombination of these coronaviruses in general. Uh, and they looked at a number of sequences and tried to figure out, you know, what's the evolution of the, these viruses? Well, if you'll recall, the SARS virus uh, started off in bats, went into civets, a small cat, and then into humans uh, through a recombination event. The same thing happened with MERS. It started off in bats, then went into dromedaries, or camels, and then into humans, and that uh, led to that uh, particular recombination event. Looking at what happened with this one, we've talked a lot about it, but this was your, your sequence that's closest to the SARS-CoV-2 is from a bat in Yunnan province uh, that was identified in 2013. The next closest relationship is with a pangolin from Malaysia, and two sequences that were identified from two different pangolins in Guangdong and Guangxi. And this sort of suggests, again, that it's a bat zoonosis, bat reservoir, got into a pangolin, recombined, uh, and then got into humans. The interesting thing about the study that, uh, from this group was that it looks like the most important selective pressure is on the spike protein. So, you know, as we develop antibodies or other animals develop antibodies to handle this, this virus, what it does is put pressure on the virus sequences to adhere to a, pr a particular sequence so that it becomes effective so it can replicate. And these are all putting pressure on the development of an effective binding domain for the spike protein. This is really, really important uh, because uh, what, what is going to happen for sure is we see this already. There are a lot of people in China who live nearby colonies of bats and have antibodies to coronaviruses in bats. 
And so we're clearly going to have recombination events that continue on. There, there's no question about that. And so how do we manage that? Well, surveillance. So we have to be sure we're, select, we're collecting samples from animal species, we're sequencing them, we're looking in people who are near bat colonies, we're constantly doing surveillance. That's why these relationships with the, 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 the Institute in Hunan, which is kind of the, the world's authority on coronavirus and bats, that's why it's important to have relationships across the country and across the world uh, so we can begin to make sure that we're doing adequate surveillance for future pandemics. We're gonna have these recurring over time and the way to prepare for them is to identify them early on and isolate them. So there was one other really, really, not controversial, but interesting paper that came out uh, just this past week in science that looked at what's driving the current pandemic. You know, what is the age group that is really driving this? And this was a group of uh, mathematicians actually from uh, England who were looking at from the Imperial College of London, who looked at 10 million records of people uh, based on their cell phone mobility data and then actually traced uh, individual deaths from people back to where, where, they, were, uh, where they were likely infected. And what they found was really fascinating and it sort of fits with, I think, what you would intuitively expect. But between the ages of zero and nine, there's very little spread, 3% of the, all the spread. And that's what we've sort of seen in elementary schools. There's been very little outbreak. 10 to 19 is about 17, uh, 7%, again, less spread, but a little bit, and we saw a few outbreaks in various uh, age groups in that, in that category. But for between 20 and 34, 35% of the spread is happening in that age group, and 35 to 49 is 38%. So if you look at under the age of 20, it's less than 10% of the spread is, is generating this pandemic, and the R value, that reproduction number, is less than one. If you look at between the ages of 20 and 49, 72% of the, of the spread is in that age group with an R value well above one. So, so what does that mean? Well, right now, our strategy is to vaccinate the people at high risk. But you know, you start thinking about it, maybe our strategy ought to be to be vaccinating people between the ages of 20 and 49, because they're the ones responsible for infecting everyone. They're also the ones that are out in, you know, out in the community, traveling around, working and spreading virus. So, uh, it's something worth having a discussion, I think, at the national level. Should we begin to focus on that 20 to 49-year-old age group uh, as, uh, as some targeted age group for vaccination? If you recall last week, I had the famous, uh, or soon to be famous, Clavin 10-point plan with, uh, that's got many names. And I think the conclusions from the data this week uh, are, to emphasize five points of that 10-point plan. The first is we need to accelerate our vaccination plan. There's absolutely uh, no question that with these emerging, emerging variants, we need to get people vaccinated absolutely as fast as possible. And I think we should have a, a national discussion about whether we should really focus on 25 to 50 year olds as the next tranche. Right now we're going down 85, 80, 75, 65. That's the way Israel did it, but Israel is a small country. Uh, where a lot of people in our country that are spreading it are in, the, in a different age group. Uh, the other thing I mentioned last week is we need to have partners worldwide around uh, surveillance. We need to be partnering with everyone in the, in the world who can help vaccinate folks and do uh, virus surveillance. This has got to be a global uh, effort. We can't do this alone because most of the variants are happening in other countries. Uh, we need to work with our partners. We also might as well get used to it, but there is going to be a booster shot <laughs> in our future, maybe even a polyvalent ma vaccine. I mean, I think there's pretty clear evidence we're going to probably need uh, some of these other variant spike proteins as future v vaccine targets. And so I would, I would expect over the next two, three years that we begin to develop an annual strategy. And if that's the case, then our current vaccine delivery system ain't very good. And so we need to figure out a way to get the country vaccinated without this kind of sending it to uh, hubs in certain urban areas. We need vaccines that can be distributed broadly. And it has to be something sustainable over the next several years. 
So those are the five of the 10 points of the, the Klopman plan. Uh, I appreciate everybody uh, last week who sent in names. There were a lot of really fantastic suggestions, which we will scroll through at the end. So far, my favorite, and I, I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, my favorite was named after Bill and Ted's Excellent Adve Adventure and Keanu Reeves, and it was named the Paul and Jim's Excellent Plan. So that's, that's my own personal favorite. It, not very sophisticated, but that's probably why I like it. And I just want to leave you with this. Sunday is Valentine's Day. Uh, what a great opportunity to think about someone you love. Uh, I know you're probably wondering, in my case, who that is, but there's no question about who that is. Look at this. And, and she's got her beautiful Valentine's Day outfit. So have a great Valentine's Day. Have a wonderful weekend, and I will see you next week. Bye. Just scroll these, right? Or, or, yeah. or should we just... Klopman's uh, treatment for COVID independence. No, no. Klopman's prescription for COVID independence. Klopman's roadway for celebrating our independence. How to have a better jo July 4th. Klopman's hunt can stop the COVID plan. Celebrating the 4th. Klopman's 10 point plan. How to be more COVID independent by July 4th. Or becoming COVID independent by July 4th. Or becoming COVID independent by July 4th. Klopman's 10 point plan. Operation Hybrid Space. Operation Wipeout. Operation Headway. Operation Momentum. Operation Evolution. Let's go.